um, and to have quite large chunks of your life taken from you and stolen from you. Within seconds, my life just went, yeah, upside down. Within seconds, I went from being this carefree young girl living in Tenerife, having the time of my life, to being a frightened fugitive. Very surreal that, yeah, you're, at one given time, your life can change in seconds. Terry, how are you? Uh, yeah, fine. How are you, Chris? <laughs> I'm <laughs> honoured, my love, that after, you know, our paths have sort of crossed on the on the bookosphere because we've both got, got books out there. And I know that we've chatted on and off for, for years. I don't know if that's through Instagram or, 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 or what. And to finally meet you and also... <laughs> To chat to someone who's got a sort of, a, can I say, a banged up abroad type story, that's, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I mean, that's where I live my life is to meet excite. you know. OK, I, I, I guess it wasn't exciting at the time, but um, it's not your run of the mill story, is it? No, no, it's, um, yeah, it's been a, <laughs> quite an horrific journey from start to finish. Yeah, um, makes and obviously. Good reading. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, we should point out from the beginning that you were innocent, which makes it more of, I mean, yeah. a lot of the banged up abroads, they just, they did it, didn't they? And, and, um, mm. um, but, but in your case, you were, you were not so much stitched up, but you were in bad, can we say bad company? Yeah. Um, I, th I think it was, um, it, it, I think like anything abroad is, is, a, a different ball game altogether. I, I've I've heard so many stories. It's, it's shocking, and I still to this day are getting stories coming out of people waiting eight years for um, like sentences to go through on on silly little crimes that only carry a two year jail sentence, and 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 they're literally waiting eight years to be brought to sentence. And th and the fact is that you are guilt by association so even if you're not committing the crime just because you're with somebody who's committing a crime you're gonna be be judged and you are going to be um tried in a court with with no with no um innocent or, or guilty plea put in mm -hmm. no it's a total different ball game over there um and to have quite large chunks of your life taken from you and stolen from you um it's it's quite um yeah it's quite nerve wracking really even to this day today I've had a message from somebody who's still awaiting a trial eight years on of something that was very very trivial yeah it, even in this country they, you, you probably wouldn't even get a sentence for it so yeah. yes in and, this, and a, I was sorry. just going to say Tony in this country they've got this what's the bloody PPR uh, the the order where they can keep you in jail indefinitely coming under that under Blair. Oh, um, uh, uh, well, I can't think the now. Names, um, the name slips my mind, but I know that, that Pepsi Watson w was on it and they have just recalled him for absolutely nothing. He didn't. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so it's um, so when you come out here in Britain because obviously I was released back in the UK um yeah you come out on a prison license so yeah you can get recalled at any time on that license for any trivial thing that you're doing yeah. uh, and then of course there are like the first second and third strike so a third strike you still get lifed off and you'll get lifed at a three-year sentence and then yeah they won't let you out until they feel fit that you are allowed to come out so yeah, it's um, but the the prison license is tough, like really tough. Yeah. Yeah, no, the it, one Pepsi's on is just it's just evil. Sorry for friends watching. Someone put it below in the comments what we're talking around. So if anyone wants is annoyed or wants to know, you can just look in the comments. But it's um, God, the poor bloke was in tears and they were they were tearing him from his, I think from his girlfriend's house. And if you know Pepsi, it's really hard to. 
put the two and the two together to justify what you're seeing. It's just horrible. Yeah. He's a really, really nice guy. He's, he's, he does so much for other people and he's, it's like, he's harmless. Um, yeah. ugh. But back to your story, t- Terry, sorry. So what was um, it like then rocking up in Tenerife as a, as a young woman? It, uh, it, it sounds a bit idyllic. Oh, well, I first went to Tenerife when I was 15 years old and the first as soon as I stepped off that plane I was like oh I want to live here this is great because Veronica's was huge back then it was like a hundred bars and discos all topped on top of one another it was jam-packed down there and it was just it, uh, yeah it was just the life basically on this lovely like island with sun 24 7 and then all these clubs and yeah and I remember walking down there the first night obviously with my mum and dad then because yeah I was quite young and um I just thought yeah I want to be in this I, I want I want to live here so yeah and obviously it took me quite a while to move out there um and yeah I think I was about 22 when I, I eventually went but we got on holiday every year running up to that me moving there and um, yeah, it, it's just a dream come true, really, to be working in sort of an idyllic situation. Yeah, it's. It, I think it's. I I've, I think there can't be a lot of children that don't cross their minds that they want to travel at some point in their life and just go away and work in either sort of like Ibiza and all them sort of areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm. Yeah, it was. It is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's the heat that hits you getting off the plane oh. isn't it that's oh, yeah and it's been freezing here again this year. yeah this time last year in lockdown I was very brown it was very warm and this year has been miserable yeah so we've we've been in this awful predicament again but the weather's been bad and of course um it's funny you know because two years ago today it was the last time I was in Tenerife for my birthday um, so um, I, I called over there today to say to him, I haven't seen you for two years. I've not been back in this island for two years. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, I've had six holidays cancelled. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and I'm stuck in miserable Britain. And all I want to do is feel that heat when I walk off that aeroplane. <laughs> Please. But, yeah, it's, um, oh, it's it, it, even in the winter, sort of like for us, it got colder. But, yeah, it's still warm. Oh, yeah still oh it's lovely yeah it's um it's it's one of them if you like the sun yeah it's, the place. What, uh, what what's the first sort of job you did over there because i know you did some of this bar, bar promotion work that's the work yeah so when sort of when i first got there it was all very much the hype and being in the thick of it um and so yeah i was a um like a pr down on veronica's yeah yeah, that's um, that was my first sort of job um, before sort of like it all went wrong. And then after sort of that sort of after the problem, that's when I got proper jobs. So yeah, so if the first sort of year was all about the party scene. And that's where it was. Thick in Veronica's being a PR, yeah, earning absolutely nothing, but not giving a <laughs> care in the world. We were having great fun. Yeah. So what? a thousand potatoes a night, if that, <laughs> if that, but still we were loving life. Yeah. Loving it. What, what year was it? So we can all. Yeah. Um, so in. I moved there in 1996. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was. A, this yeah. is. After the sort of dance era in the U, well, not after, but yeah, it was just no, done. yeah, it was it it, it yeah. was still in it was still in full flow though, wasn't it in ninety six? It wasn't it um, wasn't like my first sort of party, my first rave. I think I went to in nineteen ninety nineteen ninety one because yeah. I started to, yeah I started work at the sanctuary at, in nineteen ninety two. Um, yeah, so I was. I was thick in the rave scene, absolutely in it up to <laughs> out here. So, um, yeah, I was um, an Exodus girl. Um, so I was in the free party scene before I went into the the, the sort of more clubbier scene of the sanctuary. Um, but, yeah, I, I was in the thick of it. And are these, these names that you're saying, are they in, in Tenerife or are they in... in... No, they're, they're back here in the UK. Okay. Exodus was the illegal party scene from Luton, which right. was the original free parties they were the movement that 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 put the people out in the party scene 
And then after that was the big sanctuary, which was in Milton Keynes, which was a purpose built rave for, yeah, yeah, for just it, it, it held over 3,000 people. And oh, it was brilliant. Oh, and then and they ripped it down. <laughs> Worst thing they ever did was, was took our sanctuary away. But they literally purpose built this warehouse for raves. Yeah. Um, so I got a job behind the bar. So I got paid to rave, really. Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah, love that job. <laughs> and then sort of when I moved to, to Tenerife, it was still that, sort, but not that rave scene. It was more of the a sort of handbaggy garage sort of move. Yeah. To move yeah. Was yeah, it like yeah. a lot of sort of Euro dance, like um, Corona, Rhythm of the Night and... Yeah, um, all them sort of, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, um, yeah, it, it was a 19, yeah, 1996, 97 sort of, um, that sort of era of not, not sort of the, the bouncy rave, um, like happy hardcore. So you moved on and it, yeah, it was more the party sort of club scene, mm. but, but more, more garagey sort of, um, yeah, it wasn't as hard. I don't think there was anywhere in Tenerife apart from a little club, which is, more Spanish orientated that had more of that sort of music, but not not the heavy rave scene that was back in the UK. Yeah, no. got you. So I was on IB for a, a few years ago, and my God, let's just <laughs> let's just say anything that you wanted to buy, <clears throat> cough cough, was just it everywhere. Wasn't just, it wasn't you. You just asked any taxi driver, right? And then mm. not only did he. You know, did they buy it like like that? But also, um, it was top notch stuff. Especially as everything in the UK had been pants for years by, mm. by this stage, right? So, was that the same in Tenerife? Was I'm guessing there was a lot of lot of mules coming coming yeah. there from? Oh, um, sort of. So when when I was back in the UK in, in the rave scene, obviously, yeah, I I, I was doing sort of more of the ecstasy. And the the um, the amphetamine um, and a couple of the acids. So it was more more of the sort of the the rave scene as such. Um, and yeah, and it was only when the pills got really bad when Leah Betts died that I decided, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> so they, they were very clean, and then all of a sudden, yeah, it all become very scary for me because somebody died. It was like, no, I'm not doing them anymore. So. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember the last time I did work. I think it must have been, what, 1991, 92, and I never touched one since she died, basically. But when sort of like in Tenerife, I can't remember ever being a lot of pills being about. I, I, I can't, but there was a hell of a lot of cocaine. It was more It was more your party scene for cocaine than what it was. Then I, I can't remember there being any amphetamine over there or acid or, but there probably was, and there probably was ecstasy, but um, it was more about the cocaine. Yeah. And how was all this coming to the <laughs> island? Um, I mean, I'm looking at the geography now. It, it it is kind of a direct hop from South America, isn't it? Um, yeah. Well, when obviously me and Antonio went to Brazil on this holiday where he came back with the cocaine. We, you cannot fly direct from um, sort of Tenerife to Brazil. So we had to go into the Canary Islands. We had to hop over into the Canary to go on the holiday. So, but then usually what happens is, because when I found out in the prisons in mainland Spain, is when they're coming from South America to um it's Amsterdam, the run. They drop into Madrid to refuel. And that's where most of the drugs get caught is in Madrid. Um, so that's where it's coming into from South America and then obviously goes out into the islands. Um, but that's the main sort of drop off is, is into the mainland, not, not the Canary Islands as such. I'm not sure the ins and outs of it all onto the island of what and um, how it all gets in there but obviously it does <laughs> but uh, i'm not sure I, I it's i suppose they have all their little mules that bring it in and out um like antonio um but then it's it it was always bigger than him it, he was not he's not the big boy so no mm. Mm. did i gather a, a hint from your book did, had you got into can we just say into trouble with coke or was it just oh god 
Yeah, yeah. I, I got quite a bit of a habit by then. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's um, it's quite an easy one to get into a habit with, to be honest with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, like like with ecstasy and amphetamine, it was always about the party. Um, it was always touch and go. So it was always a weekend thing. Whereas in Tenerife, it's twenty four seven. You you literally because you're in the thick of it and in a party. Yeah, and it's there all the time. Because and because you have to. It's, it's like the cu- Dutch courage, as we used to call it. And the fact is that, yeah, d- it, you, long working nights and it's, it's just part and parcel of, of, of the job out there. Well, obviously not all of them, <laughs> but a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yes. I get it. When, yeah. I lived, when I lived in Hong Kong, when I was addicted to crystal meth, it, 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 you could go, you could go. I mean, I wouldn't go out of the house until sometimes four in the morning. Yeah. Go downtown, meet all my mates that all be in the club, and it's like, all right, and we just start dancing and uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Well, in Tenerife, it's yeah, it well, most of the nightlife doesn't start till nine, ten, eleven o'clock at night, and and you can still go literally all the way through. Yeah, it's um, it's a bit like Ibiza, really, in the height of the summer. That's just literally part party, party, party. So, um, but yeah, um, I I think this is why I was under the assumption that you were somewhere from like america zone because obviously we don't have crystal meth here thank god <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not really for shores i um yeah it's it's quite um yeah i thank god it hasn't really hit britain yeah because it is oh, it's gosh it's, yes I'm, it's I'm, I'm, it's another ball game altogether um there's 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 sort of addictions and then there's that there's that one <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and and it, it wears me out thinking about it. To be honest with you, um, yeah, it's um, I'm I'm just glad it's never got here as much, really. Um, yeah, I I I, I honour you for what you've come through, because yeah, that's hard work, very hard. Yeah, it, well, it's really kind you say. Um, I just should point out for people listening, so we don't all get confused. Is like my battle was with addiction; it was a mental health condition. Yeah. The party lives that that was the good well wasn't always good and people died but you know that wasn't the issue i'm I, for the most part had a great time or at least thought i was having a great time met amazing people and learned massive amounts about myself that i was basically told i was a failure at in in school so my um my challenge terry i don't know how well you relate to this it was like coming from a traumatized childhood yeah i was naturally predisposed to want to bury this trauma and of course if you give me a substance whether it's chocolate coffee that coffee was my first addiction it was coffee yeah. at, t- at 10 years old I used to yeah. run home from school to put the kettle on for a coffee i yeah. didn't know why i did that obviously looking back it was my first you know m- me trying to bury this yeah yeah, yeah. but um I'm not. I'm not quite sure why I was trying to bury nothing really. <laughs> well, I was later on, um, but I think the initial. But I, I, I think with the party drugs, it it wasn't about getting addicted to it. It wasn't about taking thousands of pills every day because that wasn't how it was, and you couldn't have done that back then anyway. Mm. It was all about the party at the weekend, and it was all about just going out and having fun and the music and and just feeling the love because it was the oh my god the race i i, I won't take that back for a I, I love i still like to go out to race um just not they're not as sort of like what they were back then but um i still love the music i still uh, it's all about the music it was never it was never about the drugs and the, it was more about the people in in the park because you, you will never take them memories away from the park never <laughs> Oh, I've got some, yeah, wonderful memories of my raving days. But that wasn't that wasn't an issue then. And I never took drugs then to escape. I think I took drugs then because it was more of a curiosity thing. And the fact is that I had to stay awake all night. And a part and parcel with the beauty, it went with that. If it, it, so it wasn't, I don't know. It was later on that I used substances to numb the pain, basically. Basically, of what I was going through with the trials and the, what my dad's death, and it was all different things like that. So, that, and that was when the darker days come in. 
but the original, even in Tenerife, the first sort of time that I was with there and doing little bits and bobs, it, it was it was quite fun. It was only till later that I realised, oh dear, yeah, I, I might have a little bit of a problem here. But then with your that addiction with crystal meth, because I, I will say, I, I remember being at a drug meeting when we first came out of prison and there was a little lad there and he he tried it. <laughs> and his, his words were, I had to go back on the crack because I felt like I'd been raped. And that was that really. And I was like, Oh, okay, right. We'll move along the bus then. So yeah, it's. I think it's a totally different ball game. <laughs> so, but then all addictions are addictions. But this one, I, I even I get worn out thinking about how I cope mm-hmm. with it. So yeah, I, I hold my hands up to you every day because uh, yeah, I don't think I'd probably have got through that one. No, no. I should, I should point out as well, just to keep us all grounded, that uh, it, it, it was the alcohol was the. Word. Oh God. Alcohol was a way, way were. The, 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 I should be honest about the meth. I completely lost my mental. You know, I, 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 I literally mm. went. I was phasing in and out of psychosis, mm. and the bad periods of psychosis were really bad. I mean, I was walking down the street, talk, talking to myself, and you know, yeah, ima- I, I imagining that that guy was talking to me. So I'd go and talk to him, and of course, he'd looking at me, going, "Who, who the frick are you?" So <laughs> yeah. that, I, I, I've seen videos of people on it, obviously, because I've seen documentaries, but I've never personally ever come into contact because, as I said, it, it's not here. But alcohol, yes, I'm glad you brought because obviously alcohol is my biggest issue. Alcohol for me, oh, my goodness. And, and, and I can just go out of my house and get it. So, yeah, yeah. That, that for me has been my biggest problem because it's everywhere and, and it, it's... Yeah, oh, God say I do dread to think how much I drunk in Tenerife. I really, I, I to this day, I'm surprised I come home or my liver came home with me. To be honest with you, but but alcohol is yeah, it's it's hard work. Yeah, yeah. I I've been, yeah, very just, hard. Um, you know, we're in a mental health. Let's call it what it is. It's an epidemic in this country. There's so oh. many unhappy people. Oh. Well, Everything yeah. that's just gone on is going to make it so much worse. I mean, people have just been drinking all day long in their ha- houses. And and it's. I'm not pointing this out to upset anyone. I'm pointing out to tell you the truth. That as a substance misuse specialist, yeah. the worst thing we worked with was the alcohol. Everything else causes so much chaos that you just, you have to give it up, you know? Yeah, yeah, you can yeah. only be clinically insane for so long before yeah. you, you, have to have a, you have to have a word with yourself, right? Or, But the alcohol is so it's, so, it's legal. Everybody pushes it on you. No one recognize you. Very few people recognize the danger. So it's like, go and have another one when, when it's destroying you, your family and your children are being neglected uh, uh, you know or, or or physically or mentally abused and your mates are still going go and have another one yeah and in the end i used to say yeah i'll have another just could you phone my missus and just check that's all right and then they'd go oh all right yeah i get it sorry sorry and it's like yeah yeah it's fucking you you're not you're thinking about you yeah <laughs> yeah um, not me. well to be fair i should have realized that yeah, I would have had issues with alcohol. Well, not not that. See, my mum and dad were very, very good with it. That they they let me drink in front of them. Um, it was never hiding away. But I remember getting drunk for the very first time, and I was on a twinning in Labrooks here, and I was only fourteen. My and um, I snuck two bottles of wine off and drunk the whole lot, and I nearly died. My mum found me up in a forest being sick, um, and that was my first alcohol experience now really i should have realized then but yeah possibly not 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 for me maybe i should knock it on the head um and that was as young as that age but then back then we were binge huge huge binge drinks oh my goodness it was it was massive massive binge drinking at the weekends um and yeah it, but i can't ever say that my mum and dad didn't teach me about alcohol because they did actually let me drink with them and in front of them so it wasn't a fact that yeah I was hiding in a corner in a hedge um but obviously back then I still didn't have very very strict ways with alcohol at all 
No, no. And I've seen more damage done through my life with 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 families through alcohol. Totally, totally. Yeah. But but this, this pandemic has sent everybody. See, the thing is, Chris, I when when I went through all my trouble in the in the time, the 14 years I had my issues um with with everything. I was all by myself on the prison bus. Nobody else was going through what I was going through. Nobody knew what I felt. But this time, everybody's on the bus with me and everybody knows how we're all feeling. And now they're all turning into alcoholics because they couldn't cope. So maybe they'll realise why I went round the wrong way because this is how, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's quite frightening. It, life's all about the journey and life was all about what happened to me. Um, and yeah, just as I thought I got it right, yeah, something else has come and yeah, dropped it all out. So yeah, yeah, it it, it had to be brought up as it, as much as anything because yeah, this this has been another lock 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 well locked up locked down lock anything really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course, of course, it's got deeper implications for you, hasn't it? Yeah. Now, uh, and everybody, because everybody said to me, "Oh God, you'll know this. You've been in prison for three and a half years." Uh, no, <laughs> let's not think about that. Let's think about the fact that this has brought back terrible memories of me being stuck back in a cell. Um, I think, I think that, that people don't realise this. Um, yeah, three and a half years, long time to be in a prison, and and then for me to be enforced into a situation again here, of which, yeah, it's been. been very similar to being back in prison. Back to your story. <laughs> yeah. So you've met this guy. Yeah. And you've gone to Brazil. You thought you were going on a trip and his wife couldn't make it. And on was it in Madrid that they pulled you? No, it was in Gran Canaria. Because, as I said, we were living in Tenerife at the time. And so to get to Brazil, we had to fly fly via Gran Canaria. So it's only a short flight from Tenerife. It's only about a 20-minute flight. So from Gran Canaria to Brazil. So it's dropping into Gran Canaria Airport that his bags got stopped. Yeah. Wow. And that moment, it, it, it again, from reading your book and, and the magazine articles, it, it's, it sounds like an episode of Banged Up Abroad when the... the the coat yeah. goes everywhere. Um, yeah, it, it was in my life. Yeah, it was. Well, everything was perfect, and um, within seconds, my life just went, yeah, upside down. Within seconds, I went from being this carefree young girl living in Tenerife, having the time of my life, to being a frightened fugitive, basically. Yeah, uh, and I, I'd never been arrested before. <laughs> And to be arrested in an airport with, with a lot of drugs, with guns to heads and, and people shouting at me in Spanish. Yeah, it was like a movie, like a surreal. It's like I'd stepped into an episode or a film, but I was in it. And yeah, I didn't want to be in it. Yeah, it was horrible. It was it was surreal, very surreal that, yeah, you're, at one given time, your life can change in seconds. So in that moment, did it become blindingly obvious what had happened or were you sort of in shock or in denial or, or did um, you realise this guy had, had, was trying to Im import gear and, it, and now you, he'd been caught and you were tied into it with him? Yeah, um, so what happened was our bags were both checked. Obviously, they checked mine, nothing in it, and then they checked his. And the first one, they were fine. The second one, obviously, they got a bit suspicious of them. They were it, it, doing this and... Then they took him into the back room and left me outside with my trolley, with the trolley. And the next thing I know, that's when obviously they discovered the false bottom in it. And that's when they pulled me into the room. And that's when, yeah, and that, and I walked in and I was thinking, what the hell's going on in here? And and, and that then I knew something obviously wasn't right. And that's when they'd obviously discovered the four key of coke was in the bottom and it was flying everywhere. Absolutely. Because they were trying to shovel it into bin bags. And um, that's when I realised. But then because I was so young and so very silly and naive, and then Antonio was shouting at him and then shouting at me saying, no, no, it's fine, fine. She, nothing to do with it. No, me, I mean, it was all about, it. so he was trying to tell me, don't worry, because like, you, 
I'm going to tell them you're not involved. I'm going to tell them to let you go and it'll be all over. So then I was sat there thinking, well, yeah, I haven't got nothing to do with it. So it's all his. So I won't get arrested. I'll be fine. I'm just going to walk out and go home and everything's going to be all right. And then as it slowly, they locked me in a cupboard for hours of which I was jet lagged. So I, I must have fallen asleep in there. Then they pulled me out and questioned me like three or four questions, which weren't very well translated at all. Um, then they put me back in the cupboard and then they brought me back out of the cupboard. And that's when they put the handcuff. Oh, sorry. That's all right. There oh, we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, then they put the handcuffs on me. And that's when I sort of knew, oh, something wrong here. Um, and they put my coat over the top of it to, to make it <laughs> so that I didn't look like I'd been arrested. But then I was surrounded by quite a civil officers. And, yeah, it didn't look quite sort of the path. So then they, they took me up to the local police station in, in Gran Canaria and then it hit me in there and, and then I knew I was in a lot of trouble and I could not stop crying. And it, was, it wasn't until that moment that I knew something wasn't right and then when we got took down the following morning because we, we were took to court, me and Antonio, they put us in a cell together and that's when I said to him, what the hell's going on? And he said, no, 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 it's fine. I'm going to I'm gonna make sure you don't ever go to prison and that um, I'm going to tell him who I work for. It's fine. I will always look after you. But this is Spain. <laughs> Antonio, this is Spain. <laughs> You're not going to protect me because they don't care. <laughs> I'm with you and that's all that matters. And that was it, really. And that's the last time I really saw him. I saw him at court the following year. Um, and, um, yeah, and I because none of it was translated to me. It, I was only in there for an hour with him. Were you, he, were, Terry, were you having a sort of affair with him? Or oh, no, 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 <laughs> no. Okay. He, he was, um, yeah. Antonio, for me, was more like a father figure. I'd known Antonio for years before moving out there because obviously um, I, I'd been out there lots of summers before um, and I worked for a month, a couple of years running up to moving out there just to get a feel for it. So I knew him quite well. And at that time I was missing the family a little bit and my dad, and he was a lot older than me. And yeah, I used to go up there and talk to him quite a lot, but then he always had the drugs. So yeah, it was um, more of a... He's... he's can we say he's used you, isn't he? Because he didn't yeah. want to be going for an airport on his own. No. It would have looked no. obvious. No, that's what he said to me. But then again, we didn't look quite the part, really, because yeah, I was yeah, I was quite young and he was quite older. So really, yeah, we didn't quite fit the bill. So yeah. no, I, I I think yeah, obviously they have their own mindset of thinking about how they traffic drugs, and obviously when you swallow, it's a different ball game but when you're carrying in bags yeah they try and take a mule or not a mule with them but an, an accomplish with them so that it looks a little bit easier going through but then I don't know if it was all explained to him because every bag from South America gets checked so I don't know whether he thought like in Heathrow we were going through nothing to declare or declare whereas no when you're all coming back from South America Every bag gets checked. But I don't know in this country because I've never flown to South America from Britain, so I don't know what the procedure is here. I don't know because I've never come for an airport here from that far. Yeah. But I, well, I, I know. A lot, a lot of it's done on intelligence, though, isn't yeah. it? They, yeah. they know already wh who they're yeah. going to search because they're, and, and in some countries, it's all corrupt. They're, they oh. literally, some, they're, they'll take <laughs> 10 drug mules knowing nine of them they're going to let through because they're getting a backhander and the one that they, they they're like a sacrificial lamb because if they grab the one it looks like they're doing their job yeah well they I always... know they know who it's going to be so so when you when you get sent on this job the people in the airport already know before you've even like got on the yeah. plane that when you come back it's going to be that person that this is what I gather from the banged up abroad programs anyway. Yeah, I, I I think with Antonio, because obviously um he he worked for two police officers and a judge, right? So he he was under the assumption that he was just one he was going straight through and, and, and nobody was gonna blink an eyelid at him. Um but 
the cocaine that he was carrying was 50% base. It was absolute pure crap, basically. Um, yeah, in this country, the judge would have probably said to him, <laughs> where did you get that from? And then I always, knew, well, looking back on it now, I think I know who was taking the big lot through. And because they were busy, yeah. So it's all, it, it, it's all some, yeah, you just, yeah, yeah. later on all, things fit into place and you think oh yeah i think i know what was going on there um yeah so it is i, I think it's all corruption but yeah, then while they bust the guy who's got the rubbish stuff the uh, the person yeah. behind them with the good stuff walks through but then again what was antonio's rubbish or was it quite pure they bashed it took what they wanted to take out of it and then put what they wanted to put forward this is, Spain, this is Spain, so mo- I'm going to say most likely. I mean, yeah, most likely. They yeah, love I've, that stuff over there. <laughs> not, I, well, not all of them, but. And the fact is that the, the people that he was working for were very, very high up. Mm. Uh, very. And, and, and you, you do wonder that, yeah, they took theirs, put something else in. Because 50% base cocaine from Colombia, I'm sorry. But <laughs> obviously, no, it's it's not washing with me now. Yeah. Um, no, and um, yeah, mo- most of the banged up abroads I have watched on there. Um, yeah, that most of the stuff that they bought for you is yeah, it, it, it's, it's near on pure coming back from Colombia. Uh, uh, what? So. We, what? See, there's that thing, isn't there? That Latino men. So I'm talking, well. Euro Latino, so Portugal, Spain, they can be really freaking violent, can't they? Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I've I've always said to this day that thank God we didn't get stopped going out of the airport in Brazil because I like, well I wouldn't be <laughs> no no neither of us would be here for one. I don't think we'd have got out of the airport, and for two. I would. I wouldn't have survived their prisons. Yeah. No. no I meant the um the 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 Latinos, as in the Spanish. <laughs> what I mean is, my my sh- well, I was on ship for a year, and it we pulled into Portugal. All right. Okay. Yeah, I know what you're on about. We're all yeah. getting rowdy in one of their bars. It was actually a square in Lisbon, in Portugal, and we were. Everyone was start. All the whole ship's company was starting to misbehave, and then on a queue when someone actually started to get like fisty coffee, all the barmen jumped over the bar. They grabbed chains, not axes. I mean, it wasn't that bad, but they were grabbing chains, baseball bats, and they weren't afraid to just plow in and use them. When the police turned up, they didn't, it wasn't like an English copper. So tell me what's happened here. Right. What's your stuff? None of that. It grab you, throw you in a wagon. Yeah. Cart you off. And yeah. was, and it's even a bit like that in um even in Scandinavia. I mean, I've been yeah. stopped by Swedish police and they're just yeah. fucking horrible, you know. Well, in, I think my first I, I knew about the Tenerife police, the Guardia Seville and the, the, the local police yet. I, I I'd heard rumors about the corruption even when I was a holiday maker over there. But I think my first worst sort of scenario was I was in um, one of the nightclubs and yeah it was quite early hours of the morning and two officers walked in with guns on yeah two lines up their nose took a wad of cash and walked out and I looked at them and thought oh and this is what we're up against okay okay got ya so um yeah, and, th- and then two went out, fizzled on the red on cocaine with two guns strapped to him. So, yeah, it was, um, <laughs> yeah, that was my first sort of, um, yeah. So, oh, how then, you know, Yeah, I think, yeah, life is going to be quite tough over there. I think that's the only thing that Mars, the islands, all of them, is, is the police. And the Guadalajara, and they, 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 it's just the pure corruption that goes on within the walls of the islands that that will always ruin the life over there. So, because I've always thought, yeah, I'd love to go back. I'd love to go back in there and live because it's it, the island for me was never the issue. It's my lifestyle that was quite a chaotic problem, and 
then I, I sit back and think, oh, my God, could I cope with all that corruption again? And could I cope with all these problems? And I know the police here aren't exceptionally great sometimes, but at least in our court system, you've got sort of like a legal leg to stand on and you've got a hope in hell a chance of getting somewhere. But, yeah, that frightens me over there still to this day. But But to be fair, the amount of people I've met over the years... And the horror stories that I've heard from different countries, yeah, I, I possibly wouldn't travel again if I listened to and took all of them into. <laughs> so, yeah, I think sometimes you have to realise that wrong time, wrong place, really. But the corruption is is rife in mm. most foreign countries. Yeah, you, you, especially being an English person. Yeah, it's um, it's vile. Yeah, but I've heard of some of the horror stories that I've heard over the years from people I've met. Yeah, it, I, I do wonder if I would ever travel again. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a shame. It's a big shame. Huge, huge shame. Yeah. So, well, Billy's story, isn't it? Billy Moore. Yeah. Was, God, that, the beginning of his film, um, or the film that was made about his his book. So what was it? A, a Prayer Before Dawn. Before Dawn, it? yeah. A Prayer yeah. Before Dawn. Friends, if you get a chance to watch Billy's Read Billy's book or watch the film. Oh my God! In the first ten minutes, will make you sick. Yeah, yeah. It made, yeah. made me feel really, really. Oh, because I think in the justice system throughout the world is quite corrupt. But I think the prison systems are prisons, prison wherever you are. But Thailand is oh, it's a totally different ball. Because I even said to Billy, I don't know how you are. I seriously don't. I I, I know that my prison sentence and everybody's prison sentence is different wherever you are in the world. But I just, Thailand's just totally off the Richter scale. It, mm-hmm. it, it's another prison sentence within it. So it's like South America as well. You may as well not because they, them lot run the inside of the prison, don't they? they it's not, it's not actually the guards that <laughs> look after it, it's the inmates. So yeah. it's literally a prison within the prison walls and then it's run by the prisoners. So I, I'm not sure even if I would have got out of a South American prison, to be honest with you. No, um, but to be, Billy's story, so yeah, it's heart-wrenching. Yeah, it's some of the things that he had to go through. Yeah. I, but, went um, to, um, I went to visit a girl in prison. I think I was in Ecuador. Um, what you can do, so friends at home, when you're backpacking around the world, you can go into the... Uh, I won't even pretend I remember, but there's various services that you can contact them and say, look, I'm, I'm in so-and-so. Are there any British yeah. prisoners in, in the local NIC? And they'll give you the names of people that have put their name down to be visited because obviously uh-huh. their family's a long way away. Yeah. So <laughs> there all was, I think it was Ecuador, and very violent place. Again, and lots of people arrested for, for drugs, uh, drug couriering and, I rocked up there and um, you do all the get searched and everything, don't you? You go in and then I'm sat in this waiting room and this girl come and she went, Corey, I was asleep. What, what, who are you? And I said, I'll come to visit. And she's like, really? Oh, <laughs> thank you. And I bought her a big, big, Hi. like big pack of toilet rolls. Cause apparently yeah. that, that's one of the things that they, they really had hard to get. And yeah. And she was saying that everything she had, she had to hustle for. So you got yeah. to start a little business. So hers was, she got a coffee maker from the co- the consulate, bought her a coffee maker. Then she could make little coffees for people. Yeah. Then she bought a bed, a mattress with a floor, and then she bought a bed. And it was like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I think the prison set, it's like in Spain. Yeah, the conditions weren't great at all. Um, but they weren't on the level of some of the prisons that people have been in. I think more to the fact that the Spanish, it's the corruption that goes on. Although in in the Spanish prison, um, it, it, I, th- I think it's because of the fact that you're in mixed prisons and it's it's all just a different, it's a different world out there. But yeah, that we, we had very few and far privileges as such um, and most of it, if mum hadn't have had the money to support me, yeah, I think life would have been totally different in the Spanish prison for me. Um, 
and I couldn't work because I was an English girl, so they wouldn't let me work for my money. Um, and of course, visits are very few and far between. Um, and then phone calls and letters and did it. So yeah, um, although yeah, I I couldn't even imagine. And I have seen footage of obviously the South American conditions and Thailand, but um, yeah, it's I I couldn't even imagine being in prison there. To be honest with you, I, it was bad enough where I was, um, and I I. I I, I can't I don't know how anybody gets through them sentences at all, mm. to be honest with you, because it was a struggle to get through mine in the conditions that I was in, let alone what they've been through. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough thinking about it. But I don't I don't try to dwell on that bit of it. At the end of the day, I got through it. And yeah, and I'm here to talk to people like you. <laughs> so, yeah. What it, it don't don't you don't have to say anything that is gonna like oh, no. up, upset you or anything, Terry. But what, no. what was it like when you first had to call your parents then and say oh. I'm I'm in a bit of bother? <laughs> the first phone, right? So, I, yeah, I was arrested on Thursday morning, and then I was took to yeah took up to the local police station. I wouldn't let the consulate phone my mum. You see, because I was an of eight. I, I said no you're not calling her um because I, obviously I was under the assumption I was going to walk out of there and I wasn't going to have to call them um and um it wasn't until I got to the prison on the so when was it Friday Friday night time it was and I remember walking in there and one of the girls in there was from um like was it Norway and or um one one of them and she she was the only one in the prison that spoke English anyway and she lent me her phone card quickly and I literally phoned my mum and I uh, it, this was six o'clock on a Friday night mum I've been arrested I'm in Grand Canary Airport I need bail money and I had to put the phone down and that was it that's all I had oh my god and I, I, I tried to think what was at the other end here because that was six o'clock Friday night everything was shut no phone calls to be made, and I've just dropped the biggest clangor that they've ever had in their lifetime in three words, and then uh, put the phone down. Can you imagine? Oh, I can't even imagine what they went through at that time. I was bad enough with the fact is that I had to make that little phone call, but you imagine what was happening here. And and they couldn't do anything. They couldn't make any fact. They didn't even know hardly where I really was because I, I just sort of said. And they didn't even have been on holiday to South America. This was oh my god, it was. Yeah, I do. I do actually think about Jesus Christ because Western Union wasn't that easy back then. Transferring money was quite, and yeah, it was quite <laughs> yeah hard experience. So yeah, and of course, no consulates was open. No this, no that. I can't even. I think Mum called John Burko. I can't remember. I think it was, she called the MP and then he made direct and found out where I was. I think this is how it all ricocheted through the weekend. Um, and then and then I think they got the money wired over on the Tuesday morning because obviously, yeah, nothing was open till, yeah, so I had to stay in there Did till you then. Get, you got bail then? Yeah, I got bail originally. Yeah, this is where all the problems came in because they actually bailed me out of the prison back to Tenerife without a passport um and that's where the justice system all goes a little bit wrong after that because it's all about this money and it's all about crop solicitors it's all about more money and yeah and you just don't know whether you're coming or going really so, so was 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 jumping bail an option well see when i came out um i've been out what a week and mum flew over and we talked and we talked and we said, right, we're, we're going to fight this. Um, so we went to see a solicitor. And um, and then that's when I had the aneurysm, I had the fatal brain hemorrhage on the Friday. So she flew out, I think it was a Sunday, and then on the Friday I got really ill. And then I was in hospital for six weeks, you see. And by that time, I'd missed all my deportation orders, I'd missed everything. So, and then I was so ill um that yeah that wasn't an option then it was it was I had to stay and I had to fight it so no doing a runner at that point was not not even on the card and mum sort of said because mum's a very honest and very um yeah woman that she said look right if if you've done nothing wrong we're gonna fight it 
and we're going to fight because obviously we didn't know about the corruption over there. We didn't know about the legal system being so bad. So she, yeah, she said, we're, we're going to fight this. We're going to get a good solicitor and we're going to fight it. Yeah. But then I was so ill anyway, nothing, you know, everything was took out my hands at that point. So, and, nah. and what, what was it like then, Terry, when you, when the judge said 10 years? Oh, well, he didn't. Right. So this, this is another thing. So in England, so me and you, we go through the airport together. You've got drugs in your suitcase. I've got no drugs in my suitcase, but I'm with you. So we initially would be arrested. And then we obviously, I don't even know half the time whether through, through paperwork that I'd be taken to, to, to the, the police cells or I would just be cautioned or maybe, yeah, or given a court date. Um, but you obviously plead guilty. And then I plead not guilty. So then you probably stand remand, and but we'd be separated, totally separated. But at this point, I would never see you again, and you wouldn't see me, especially at trial, because then you go for sentencing, and then I'd have to go to trial, and they'd have to prove that I was involved. And to prove that sort of, it's very difficult in the UK to prove a conspiracy case that you were actually knowingly with, especially if you come up and said yeah no I work for xyz um these aren't my drugs but I'm the one carrying them and she had nothing to do with it it would boof that'd be it separated gone in Tenerife no we both go to the court both sit there there's no pleas put in there's no guilty or not guilty um he stood up and talked for an hour, of which I still to this day have no idea what he said, because none of it was translated to me. Um, he just kept pointing at me. <laughs> so I hope he wasn't saying, yeah, it was all that. Um, so, and then I think they asked me three or four questions, one of them being, which one's your suitcase, the green one? Oh, the one without the drugs in. Yeah, that's it. And that was it. We got up, we walked out. I went back to Tenerife on my aeroplane. He went back to the prison, got on the aeroplane. Lawyer's like, oh, oh, yeah, fine. Finished, over with. You'll be fine. Two days later, we get a phone call from the court. I've been sentenced to 10 years on a phone call with a 76 million peseta fine. And and, and then, they, but you're not going to prison yet because you can appeal. And then, and then, and then, and then it's the next one. And so... It was just, it, it was the biggest circus of a, of a, of a court case. You'll ever probably, yeah, they probably, it's quite a few out there, but it is nothing compared to how you would be tried back in the UK. It is absolutely ridiculous. At that yeah. point then, was it not just tempting to... No, it, it, by this time, I was into, it, it was that thick of it that... It, and that much media was involved. It wasn't really an option at that time for me to get on a plane and run out. So we just, we got more lawyers who were corrupt and wanted more money. So mum and dad were like nearly 60 grand deep in debt here. To be honest with you, I've actually got quite a good life over there now because I've got a proper job, I have a proper house. Everything was more normal. It was a normal life. It wasn't the chaotic Veronica's life. It was a nice life. And I liked my life in Tenerife. I'm a little cat. I'm a little house. I was, yeah, loving life again. And at that point, I didn't really want to come home. So it wasn't until um, the year 2000 that we we were just getting quite sick of it all. And then John Burke, um, the MP, John Burko, got a letter from the um one of the foreign officers i think which said in the translation she was released in 97 on the date with no readmission so then he said well is it not all over and i said well i don't know because we've heard nothing from the lawyers i don't know where the appeals got so mum and dad said to me at the Manellium because they flew out to spend the, that big new year with me and i'm um, i said to him shall i apply for a new passport and they said why not so i filled all the forms out they took it home. Week later, what arrives in my mum and dad's doorstep? New passport. Mum said, well, that's it. God, that's be over. So I said, well, I'll come home then. So then um, we, what was it? We, I think it was, we planned to come home in the February. Now, I, I sort of knew we were doing something wrong. 
but we yeah it, it was it was we didn't know basically we did think it was all over but I, half of me knew that it possibly wasn't so what we did because of the aneurysm I didn't fly so what well I, I didn't want to fly all the way back to Britain but then we didn't want to fly all the way back to the going through passport control so what we did was we we went out of Tenerife to Madrid and then got the overnight plane from Madrid to Paris because there's no passport control and then it was coming through so we got Paris to Waterloo and it was coming back through Waterloo. So imagine we'd come all this way home, two days travelling, big mum, yeah, loads of bags, and um, thinking, yeah, walk through Waterloo, little shit, come here, you two. Oh, my God, really? Um, they were adamant me and mum were carrying drugs. Adamant. But little did they know it was me. I was the problem. But they took my passport off twice, checked it, no problem. Because, of course, then there was no major interpol, was there? There was no talking between countries and there was no European arrest warrant at that point. So I wasn't flagging up on their system that I was wanted. So, yeah, they let us through. But if they'd have checked the bags properly, in one of the bags was um, receipts from Tesco the day before when Mum had bought it off the daily counter. So, yeah, it was hindsight now because I spoke to quite a few people within the prison system about this, what we'd done coming home. And they said, your mum, you put her in. In such a vulnerable situation because if you'd have been nicked then she would have been arrested as well and that carries a huge sentence for carrying a fugitive back into the country so looking back on it yeah it was it was, it was very naughty what we did it's i'm very um yeah sort of bad of me for putting her into that bad situation which i didn't think was a bad situation but could have been really quite for mum um to get me home but then at that time, I just wanted to come home. And it was a good job that I did come home because in the April, my father was diagnosed with cancer. And now looking back on it all, I really don't think I would have coped with that, with me being stuck out there. Mm -hmm. So sometimes things happen for a reason for you to come home. Yeah, and it wasn't until 2003 that they issued the European arrest warrant and then they come and arrested me again at home. And this is eight years on. No, yeah, no, six years on from the initial arrest. So, yeah, it's been... Um, but I, I, I'll i be honest with you, Chris. The, the only person I blame for all this fiasco within the legal system was the original judge that bailed me. Because if she had never bailed me, I would have run through the, the system and maybe have had a better chance of fighting the case within the prison because hopefully well <laughs> you never know Britain might have stepped in a bit more and helped me out because then they could have followed the court cases they could have helped me through the procedures but because this initial judge gave me bail it all went wrong from then on but I, they always say that they think that they give you bail so you'll do a run and go home so yeah. then you're System, but then why don't with why pick me up on a blooming European arrest warrant so many years on and cause all the flipping yeah rigmarole again because I had to fight a court case here for two and a half years to try and fight my extradition because it was all because I got arrested on under the old warrant so I mine was the yeah with mine was the last case in Britain to be done on the, the old warrant that's why it was thrown up in the court in the in the press because um yeah the new warrant was literally they come to your house, pick you up and throw you out at the airport and you don't even have a chance to fight the case here anymore. So they wanted to know how I felt and that's why the media took such a big interest in it. But then then the government didn't help me either. So, so don't know. how long was it between what happened in the airport, you getting arrested and you actually going and serving your time? At that, it's, that sounds like a load eight, of years. Yeah. Eight years. It was eight, yeah, eight and a half years. And how many did you have to serve over there? I did, well, I I went back, back thinking that I'd have to do the full 10. That's when I initially got onto the aeroplane. That's exactly what I thought I was going to do with the full 10 years. So when I stepped foot onto the island, um, uh, Fair Trials International was still following my case. So they helped me to get a fresh lawyer to apply for the pardon, because the royal pardon, or the indulto, as they call it, is the last procedure in there when you've rinsed all the court. That's the last thing you can apply for. It, it's a bit like in Thailand, I think, with the with the pardoning. So I they found me a lawyer, which I was very dubious of, 
um, getting because of the problems that we'd had previously. Um, but she just won a massive court case through drugs and she got her notch. So she was adamant and she she knew she'd win it. So I only saw her the once in the prison and she, she was very confident um, because she'd won this initial case um, that she would win mine. So that was fine. It was it was a very small amount compared to all the rest of the money that poor mum had laid out. But I knew it would take a long time to get through. So at that point, I thought, right, I need to go back home again because I need to go on a repack because of the fact that mum, it was too much for mum to visit me over there all the time. And I just wanted to come back to Britain because it was a lot easier. So I applied for the repatriation and um, I served 19 months in Spain and then 19 months back here in the UK. And then I was granted the royal pardon or partial pardon. Um, and they dropped my sentence from 10 to six years. So on time served, I got out on the, the prison license. So, yeah, I did about three and a half years in the end and then three, three, three years on license. Uh, Jeez, what a bloody rigmarole! I know. <laughs> for something yeah. you didn't do in the first place. That's um, the, how have you come to terms with that injustice, Terry? Um, well, I think over the years, is I can't live with. It's like hatred. It's like a lot of people say to me, "Do you hate Antonio?" No, I don't hate him because he did what he did. I don't like him a lot, but I don't hate him because it's a bit of a strong emotion. Um, with with what went on with me, it, I, it's, oh, I don't know how to explain it to you. I try not to, uh, yeah, I am very angry with the, the, the legal system, but I can't, I can't live with the anger because, no. yeah, it will eat me up again. And, um, and I've got enough, bits of issues to deal with to try and live my life as normal now as I can um yeah it, but I meet so many people that have had an injustice against them it's, it's unreal so I'm not I'm not the only one and I won't be the only one ever again um because w- once you think something's all right it's not all right <laughs> and once you think you've got on top of something it and I I, I won't fight that on my own um i've 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 done lots of um talks for european lawyers and um all different um sort of um with with fair trials international and prisoners abroad but i remember doing one talk with a lot of european lawyers and i remember a little spanish girl coming up to me at the end and saying that she tried to be legit but she had Guardia Seville outside her house. She was threatened. She was this. And she said, how do I fight good with bad? Because I'm just fighting every day against a system that has got it up against you. So it, it, it is. It, how, do, how do they do it? How, how, how in a system that is so bad do, do you fight 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 it, really? It's, it, yeah, it's, it's quite frustrating, really. But at the end of the day... I've been through what I've been through um, and it's made me who I am today. Um, It's been tough. I I won't deny it. It's been really tough. But then I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people out there with with stories a lot worse than mine. Um, Yeah, that's a a good way to look at it. Yeah. But but it's, it's, it's like possibly with you. I only wrote the book is to give people knowledge of what they are letting themselves in for. Um, it, sometimes knowledge is a better foresee, but then there's always people out there that will be making mistakes and there's always a need for drugs and there's always a need for this. And there's always, so there'll always be a need for somebody to be bringing them drugs into the country or somebody to be doing this and so, or somebody to be the yeah, X, Y, Z. Um, and we all know that, this is how the world goes but yeah prison prison's tough if you're a boy girl or whatever it's 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 tough <laughs> i see because i know most grown men it, it, if you don't want to be in prison yeah it's it's, it's not it's not a good place uh, but. can we finish then terry sorry if this is a bit cliche but 
what what was it like then when you fo- finally walked out those gates? Uh, well, I didn't look back. They told me never look back, and I didn't. I I never looked back, and I've never looked back. That, that that was their one advice to me when I walked out of that prison. Don't look back, Terry, and we won't be seeing you again. And I said, no, you won't. <laughs> and um, but it wasn't. It, it was it was a bit odd how I was released because they they got word in the afternoon that my pardon papers are coming. We I I had a funny feeling that it wouldn't be long, um, but yeah, they it was the last thing that that noms the offender management unit opened up the email in the afternoon. She was going home, and then they had to sort all the, the dates out. And I remember my name being called over the channel. I'd just been on the phone to my mum moaning about the fact that nothing had been happening and um and I thought oh my god and I walked in and the governor was in there and I thought oh my god get shit out what was I wrong and she said better go and pack your bags you're going home I was like you're kidding me I literally run out of there phoned my mum and screamed at her mum mum I've been released come and get me put the phone down again and that was it so from start to finish she had one phone call in Gran Canaria telling her that I'd been arrested <laughs> And then one phone call screaming at her to come and get me because I've been let out. So these two phone calls are very prominent in my sentence. And um, but it didn't sink in because I was released at seven o'clock that night. And I remember coming home here um, because I was under prison license. So I couldn't get involved with the media. Nobody could be told that I'd been released until later on. So I come on very quietly and I woke up at five o'clock in the morning. And I was walking about the house thinking, Jesus, is this real? And then mum got up as well. And it was, it was like we dreamt it. It was, it was, it was possibly the most surreal moment of my life. But then two phone calls are prominent in my life. The one to tell her I've been arrested and the one to tell her I've been released. And they were literally three or four words screaming out, put the phone down. <laughs> so yeah, it was surreal. Um, but I, I won't deny Chris, life, life's not been easy since I've been out. Not at all. And um, yeah, uh, I don't suppose it, it will get much easier for a while, but it might calm down one day. <laughs> one day, yeah. I might say. <laughs> I'd, recommend I might... <laughs> to, uh, I'd recommend to anyone, if you're struggling, what on, on my YouTube channel, I've got a playlist, one of my playlists called The Commando Coach. And it, it, it's just. I'd recommend anyone struggling, just go and watch it. Binge watch it over a weekend. There's, they're all short videos. Um, we also have a life coaching group on Facebook called, um, if you just go Facebook forward slash groups, sorry, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Chris Thrall. And we just have a very positive, happy group on Facebook. We don't let any mainstream nonsense into it. No, so you're not going to see anything about, um, you know, what's been on the news or anything like that because we don't believe we don't believe in watching it. And people are positive. We 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 get up in the morning. We smile at the sun to say thank you for our lives. We jog around the block or walk around the block or cycle or whatever. We have a green smoothie at lunchtime because it makes us feel mental <laughs> in a good way. Good way. <laughs> and, and we always take action every day towards our perfect future. And when we're not feeling it, that's fine. We sit on the couch and we, we have a chill day, two days, week, month, whatever it takes to get us back. And um, these simple philosophies, Terry, of really helped a lot of people um, yeah you know we, we've got people recovering from some very nasty illnesses and stuff and, <laughs> and 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 a lot of them have never heard of things like alkaline diet and 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 you know yeah. showing gratitude for life which is a you know which which you've done when when you say there's always people that got it worse that's being grateful isn't it for but for what yeah. we've got so anyway you're more than welcome to, to to join us there yes um what what does the future hold and your book is passport to hell i'm looking at it now i'll i'll put a link below folks very well written so there we go <laughs> um so at the moment um obviously i want to get through this 
little blip in our lives again. And then hopefully life might come back to some sort of normality, whatever normal is. Um, and we are in talks at the moment, and have been for quite a few years about putting this on the big screen. Um, and um, yeah, and that is something that I'd like to happen. I think that um, there's a lot of um, messages to come out in it. Um, and it's got the rave scene and yeah, it's got all, all the issues that I went through. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite hopeful that it will happen. Um, that's been my dream that one day somebody would pick up on it. Um, I've always been told that I'll write another book, um, but I'm not sure what the content will be, but they said I'm not to think too much about it because it will just happen. Um, so yeah, it possibly, but I think there's a book in everybody, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I think everybody could sit down and write a book. Um, but um, yeah, and and to be to be as free as possible, really. So and to be free of this again. So yeah, I just want my freedom back. Um because I fought so long to get it, and now it's been took away from me again. So yeah, I just want us all to be free again. Yeah. So it would be nice to to have our lives back because yeah possibly if we we ever took this interview what a couple of years back we wouldn't be talking sort of on on the line that we would have gone on to because of the fact is that our lives wouldn't have happened or this wouldn't have happened to us but yeah it's um i'm i'm hopeful that yeah that will come off and i'm i i like to not get too excited about it just in case it doesn't but yeah i am i'm quite secretly very excited about the prospects of this going on to mm. yeah different different options and different avenues so um but um but life's just a little bit quieter for me i just get up every day go to work i'm a little cleaner at the moment i do what i love because i've got ocd so i love it <laughs> best about I'm the best cleaner in the whole world and um and yeah i just um i'm thankful like you every day that i get out the sun well sort of out and i wake up and i've still got my life intact so yes um it's quite easy that yes. Yeah, and people can find you on in Instagram. Is that the best way? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and and Twitter. So yeah, I'm I'm out and about sit on them, and um, yeah, and I'll answer any sort of sort of questions that anybody has regarding all different issues that have been brought up on this and in the book. So, and sometimes with like my sort of mental health issues with the panic attacks and everything and and um sometimes i just like to talk to people um and because it, it is good to talk yeah um i find that a lot of the time when i was suffering with the panic disorder when i come out of prison i didn't talk to anybody i didn't tell anybody about it and that's when i suffered the most but now when i feel quite sort of down i'll go and talk to my mom tell her what's going on and then yeah my mood sort of lifts a little bit so um, yeah, it's always good to keep your friends around you and talk. Yes, so definitely. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Terry, stay on the line because I'm going to hit the record button off. I just will thank thank you personally. Um, so, so I will thank you now for the purpose of the camera, Terry. You're absolutely lovely. Please thank don't you. go don't go changing. Um, no. I'm so glad that you've come through what you have and um you've your 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 head's in the right direction for a very bright future uh, thank you for coming on the podcast yeah thank you for having me oh no yeah. and, and anytime you want to come back maybe our, our subscribers have got some questions they want to ask we could do a live a live yeah. chat on youtube and they can put us questions in the chat that would be yeah, that's fine that it's, would be nice so thank yeah. you again yeah. And to everybody at home, massive love to you all. Please yeah. look after each other and we'll see you next time. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone.